Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. No love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Neither height nor depth. Neither height nor death can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds me in his love. Neither height nor death can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds me in his love. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against?
Well, good evening, church family. We're so glad that you're here this evening uh, for this all-generation service, and it really is an all-generation service. We've got young to old, and uh, we're thankful that we're able to be here on this evening to gather, to hear from God's Word um, as it is preached, and also to sing praise to Him. Just want to let you know, if you are new here, if this is your first time, uh, we want to encourage you to use the digital connection card, and you can do that by going to includefaith.org forward slash connect if you're online. If you're a guest here, which we've had a number of guests throughout the weeks, and we're thankful for that, um, you can also scan the QR code that's right there at your pew, and that'll take you right to the website as well, or use the uh, connection card that's right there in the pew as well, the physical connection card. Um, as always, if you're a guest, you want to connect with us, find out more about our church, maybe set up a meeting, a meal, coffee uh, as a guest, or even as a church member, we're always willing to do that. And you can do that through some of the different means that we have. The, uh, our phone number, just text us, 937-426-6480, or email us, info at includefaith.org. And as always, all resources for our church, what's going on, includefaith.org. And you can learn more about that. Well, let's go ahead and stand. We have the great opportunity to sing praise to our God this evening. And uh, Brother Phil was excited about this song and being sung. So we're going to sing this out. God is for us. We won't fear the battle. We won't fear the night. We will walk the valley with you by our side. You will go before us. You will lead the way. We have found a refuge only you can save. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Great job singing that first verse. It's even when I stumble. Even when I stumble, even when I fall, even when I turn back, still your love is sure. You will not abandon, you will not forsake, you will cheer me onward with never-ending grace. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Neither height nor depth. Neither height nor depth can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds me in his love. Neither height nor depth can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds me in his love. Sing with joy now. Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. No love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Sing with joy now. Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. No love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Great singing that very familiar song that we've been learning uh, for multiple times. Let's go ahead and sing this new song that we're going to begin learning and that we sung this this morning. That is Jesus, Your Mercy. Try to follow along the best you can, church body, as we learn this together. Jesus, your mercy is all my need. I have no defense, my guilt runs too deep. The best of my works pierced your hands and your feet. Jesus, your mercy is all my need. Jesus, your mercy. Jesus, your mercy is all my 
goodness I claim the grounds of my hope. Whatever I lack is still what I need most. Jesus, your mercy is all my hope. Praise the King who bore my sin, took my place when I stood condemned. Oh, how good you've always been to me. I will sing of your mercy. Jesus, your mercy is all my rest. Fears weigh me down and enemies press. The comfort I cling to in life and in death. Jesus, your mercy is all my rest. Great to King who bore my sin, took my place when I stood condemned. Oh, how good you've always been to me. I will sing of your mercy. All my joy. Jesus, your mercy is all my joy. Forever I'll lift my heart and my voice to sing of a treasure no power can destroy. Jesus, your mercy is all my joy. Praise the King who bore my sin took my place when I stood condemned. Oh, how good you've always been to me. I will sing. Praise the King who bore my sin, took my place when I stood condemned. Oh, how good you've always been to me. I will sing of your mercy. may be seated as we go into this time of giving. We want to encourage everybody here uh, to continue giving to the Lord through their local church. And so as the music is going to play, we're going to continue by giving and giving back to the Lord. You can do that very easily by going to includefaith.org forward slash give by uh, texting the number that's going to be on the screen before you as well. And I just want to encourage you, continue to give. Let's prepare our hearts for the message that pastor is going to bring from 1 Samuel tonight. Uh, let's, let's anticipate it. Let's be eager to receive what God has for us from his word tonight. Pastor Jordan, all those involved in praising. What a great song, right? How many are familiar with that song we just sang, Jesus, Your Mercy? How many familiar? Not too many of us, huh? All right. Well, it's a good thing, right? Learning new songs of truth, and that's such an encouragement to our hearts. So maybe this week you pop that into YouTube or your playlist or whatever it is you got there, right? It's a help and encouragement as we sang great songs there this evening. Have some more ahead as well. Join me, 1 Samuel chapter number 8, 1 Samuel chapter 8. Again, Samuel's in the Old Testament, so if you're following along online or you're here in person, 1 Samuel chapter 8, it's in the Old Testament. You're going to get through Genesis, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and you'll get to the point you find Samuel. If you get to Kings and Chronicles, back it up a little bit, or just Google 1 Samuel chapter number 8. As we come back to our series, after our hiatus for two weeks about elections and whatnot, coming back to our series out of Samuel and seeing what God is doing in their lives And the beauty, again, of the Old Testament is its principles and truths from God 
being lived out or born out in people just like you and just like me. Uh, People that have the frailties we have, have the issues we have, and we get to frankly learn, as Paul said from their example, of times they made good decisions in faith, Sometimes they didn't, right? <laughs> and so that helps us build our worldview, our narrative, our understanding. So 1 Samuel chapter number 8, tonight we're going to talk about when God grants us what we really want. What God grants us what we really want. Now this is, I, I can't stress it enough, a pivotal altering chapter in the nation of Israel's existence. It changes so much about them as a nation, their relationship with God, and the trajectory they take from here. And so this is one of those chapters in the Old Testament that is dramatic. Like if Genesis 12 is dramatic, when you think about Abraham and getting the covenant and being called out, that's a dramatic chapter. You think about some of the other ones, Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. But this one is the one in that same echelon, if you would, and so showing man's heart with a covenant-keeping God and what takes place. So 1 Samuel chapter number 8. I'll read aloud. You follow along with me. Verse 1, it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second, Abiah, and they were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel, what did he do with his displeasure? Prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even unto this day wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods. So do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, how be it, Yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked him of a king. And he said, this would be what God told him to tell them, and he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He shall take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be His horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots, and he shall appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and will set them to his ear to the ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants, your maid servants, your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep, yet they shall be his servants. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you. Scary next sentence, right? Or part of the sentence. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refuse to obey the voice of Samuel, and they say, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we may also be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord, The Lord said to Samuel, hearken unto their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, go ye every man unto his city. No doubt in this room, most of us that are either college age up have heard the saying, you are free to make your own choices, but not free from the choices you make. 
the axiom is lived out in front of us in this very passage by the men and women of Israel. As they, as a collective nation, decide to reject God's rule and what was that theocracy, him ruling, and they desire and embrace a monarchy, an earthly singular ruler. While the passage begins with a situation that may resonate with us at some level due to the corruption there with Samuel's sons, we'll discover just how damaging and foolish this shift is for Israel now and throughout their history as we continue going through the books of Samuel. It was difficult to read, then see lived out in the nation's history. Tonight, I want us to grasp and, and see what takes place Let it be a cautionary tale in our own hearts and in our communication with others. But then may we also find great encouragement about the character of our God and how he intervenes in our life even when we do make decisions and demand of him things which are not in our spiritual interest or well-being. And so here in our passage, Israel's rejection of God as their ruler does not come without dire warning about the consequences of their rebellion. There's a reality for us to take away. Something to put down in our hearts tonight is this is such a monumental chapter, and really the heart behind their choice is so real, so vivid in our everyday life experience. It's this. Rejecting God's rule and warnings can get you what you think you want, but not ultimately what you desire. Now think about that for a second, right? You see what we're doing there and talking about? When we say, no, I don't need God to rule in my life, and no, I will not heed his warnings. I need what I want. I get this, it's what I want. I get this, it will finally be. And There are times that when we say no to God, we will get, quote, what we think we want, but we'll find out too late it's ultimately not what we desired at all. And so tonight, Let's learn this lesson. Some of us have probably in this room learned this lesson a few times, right? Some of us have a testimony of this, and that's not a bad thing in and of itself, as we'll talk about at the end. But some of us know this personally. Some of us have experienced this. But tonight, I would call all of us to recognize this reality and go forward with it and help others as well. First reality we see tonight is this. Israel saw the failures of their current leaders as a reason to reject God's greater plan for them. As we roll into verse 1, Israel has enjoyed Samuel's steady spiritual guidance over decades. Over the course of his life, he's guided Israel to continue their covenant relationship with their good God. He's faithfully proclaimed to them God's desire as declared through the Mosaic law and cautioned them against idolatry. Samuel has been faithful to judge righteously. And again, coming off the hills of the book of Judges, this is a breath of fresh air, right? Every man's doing right in his own eyes. Judges would have to step in. And here Samuel is stepping in, guiding the nation, pulling on the nation, trying to help anchor the nation to their covenant, keeping God. So that's what we discover there in verse number one, and that he's made his sons judges in Israel. In verse two and three, we discover Samuel's old. His time of stewardship as a judge in Israel has come to an end. And as that window begins to close, sad to say, history somewhat repeats itself, doesn't it? Did any of us have some flashbacks as we were reading here as Samuel's sons do wickedly? Was it not hailing us back to what we've already looked at and preached through when Eli's sons did wickedly. And so we're having a bit of a history repeating itself moment here as Samuel's offspring use their position to do that which is ungodly and they don't meet the spiritual criteria necessary for such an appointment. Now catch it. His sons that we read about there in verses 2 and 3, Joel and Abiah, they're well aware of the Mosaic law. They've been exposed to their father's role as a judge, and yet they choose to abuse the office for their own benefit, just as Eli's son did. Uh, sons did. They undermine the integrity of the position as a judge by accepting bribes. Look at verse three. What happens here? And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. The reason this is so offensive 
is that judges in the nation of Israel, and somewhat mirrored, not perfectly, but mirrored in our own culture, they were there, and in this theocracy, these judges were appointed by God as a position to guide Israel in his ways personally, to help mediate disputes among them, and to direct them nationally to reliance upon God. But instead, what are we finding? Joel and Abiah are doing what? Glad to speak for God to the highest bidder. It's so perverse. It's so contrary to God's nature and God's design and God's desire for them as judges that they would take in funds and then blaspheme God by speaking for him on his behalf as a judge, but really just whoever had the deepest pockets could get Joel and Abiah on their side. So after an unspecified amount of time where this is taking place and taking place and taking place, the men who are representatives of the nation there come to Samuel in verse 4 and 5. In verse 4 it says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, came to Samuel and to Ramah, and said, Behold, thou art old, thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. The perversion of the judge's sons creates a temptation for the nation to reject that appointment and demand an earthly ruler. Here we have the representatives of each tribe appearing before Samuel, and what they are requesting is to adopt a secular governmental system that they had seen all around them, right? They would seen it with the Philistines. They would seen it over here with the Kohathites. They would looked around. They would seen over and over how these nations acted or how these tribes acted in a similar manner. While this may seem like a legitimate request, given the nature of Samuel's sons and their activities, let's understand what they're really asking for and what it implies. In their time, earthly kings were looked to and sought after to ensure social justice took place in the realm and national security was upheld. And as with all bureaucratic institutions, what will it always do? Just expand, right? It'll expand It will grow. It will require subsidization by those whom it protects. And Israel says, we want to be like every other nation. And therein is the problem. We know Israel was to be what? A distinct nation under the rule of their covenant keeping God, distinct from every other nation around them. And so this move here by their elders is motivated by a desire to be like, to conform into the image or the likeness of pagan nations. And I want you to consider this. They are saying, in effect, we as the covenant people, we want to ignore what you said in the revelation you gave us in the Ten Commandments. And beyond that, in the Mosaic Law. We want to ignore your authority, and we want to ignore how you've worked despite not having an earthly king here. We want to ignore all that and conform to what we see around us and what we think works best for us. This will give us as a nation what we're after. We won't have to worry about a judge. We won't have to worry about his sons. We won't have to worry about a theocracy. We'll have somebody that we can look to, that we can control, that we can appoint, that will do for us. So what does Samuel do with such a request? Well, secondly, we see God instructs Samuel to grant their request, though he's grieved by the unholy motive behind the request. This request grieves Samuel deeply. I want you to consider this. Samuel obviously knows his sons aren't doing right, so he already has that heartache, right? But then the people he's ministered to, the people he has devoted his life to judging righteously, the people he has pushed to pursue their covenant-keeping God and to rebuff the temptations of idolatry that have pulled upon them, these people come to him, and what do they do? They, re- they reveal their desire to say, we don't want God as a ruler. We want to live as we please. Samuel's grieved, and catch how a spiritual man handles his grief, how a spiritual woman handles her grief. He goes to the Lord in prayer. And as he prays with God, he finds from God perspective he didn't have necessarily. In verses 7 and 8, God tells Samuel, their request is nothing new. (laughs) I mean, Samuel, I hate to burst your bubble here, 
It's nothing new, and I'm giving you, give you some specific direction. He contextualizes their errant desire in verse number 7. Look what he says here in verse 7. He says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken to the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me. And get this, God gives the context, that I should not reign over them. God comforts Samuel's ailing heart by giving spiritual clarity about the motivation of the Israelites. He tells Samuel to grant the request, but says their request, it's spiritually corrupt in nature. While Israel may claim it to be logical, it may be needed due to Samuel's sons and other nations around them getting a different status or a higher status than the nation of Israel, God peels back that facade, doesn't he? He peels it back with his holy perspective, his omniscient perspective, and he peels back the facade to reveal that their request has very little to do with the nations around them. It is squarely lodged. It is squarely aimed at him as their ruler. They desire independence from him and the ability to rule themselves. But then in verse 8, God says, this isn't anything new, unfortunately, for my people. In verse 8, what does he say? According to all the works which they have done, now catch it, catch the timestamp from God, since the day I brought them out of Egypt, even unto this day. Whew. <laughs> he gives perspective of, hey, here's what's motivating them. And he says, but it isn't anything new. This is not a shock, unfortunately, with Israel. He helps Samuel see what's taking place has unfortunately been taking place for a long time. It is the standing practice of the nation of Israel. And so he rehearses hundreds of years worth of their nation's history by speaking of the exodus out of Egypt. And what did God use as his litmus test or as his evidence to declare verdict upon his people to Samuel? He says there in verse number 8, according to all the works which they have done, which with they have forsaken me and served other gods. You see, the outward decisions of their will and their lifestyle manifested that they had an inward spiritual problem. The problem, according to God, was their idolatry. They were willing to forsake allegiance and submission to their covenant-keeping God to pursue some other lower-G God that they thought would bring them satisfaction or help or fulfillment or independence of God's rule in their life. And so this is their habit. But I want you to catch this. It's so important. It's a revelation here to Samuel. Not that it's a shocking revelation, but a clarifying revelation. God is binary in the assessment of the majority of the Israelites and their history. And what I mean by that is this. God looks at it that they either served him or they served other gods, but it wasn't both. It was one or it was the other. And thus, he reminds Samuel that the grief he is experiencing is what he, as the covenant creating, making, and keeping God, has been experiencing for centuries with the Israelites. And so the rejection he is experiencing, as Samuel that is, it's not towards him. God says it's ultimately towards me. The rejection is against me being their authority. Their rejection is against me being upon whom they must rely. One person said it like this. He said this, The people's demand for an earthly king represented the political manifestation of a spiritual problem. So they have this issue. They bring it to Samuel. Samuel brings it to God. And I want you to see thirdly tonight, God warns the people of the consequences of their rebellion. God is so faithful in spite of his holy nature being greed by his idolatrous people that he's still willing in his mercy to do what? Intervene, to throw up the red flags and wave them and say, you don't want to do this. And so look at verses 9 through 18 here and see what happens. God warns the people of these consequences. In verse number 9, God instructs Samuel to grant their petition, but note the caveat in verse 9. He says, Now therefore, hearken unto their voice, how be it, yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. What's the caveat? 
Well, tell them they'll get what they want, but it will cost them a great price. God wants the Israelites to know just how trajectory altering, trajectory altering this decision will be. Not because God in heaven is this ogre looking to smash them. All right, is that how you're going to treat me? Well, here's how I'm going to treat you then, nation of Israel. No, no, no. It's the natural outflow of their rejection of God. It's not God in heaven slamming his fists on the desk and throwing a fit. No, no. It's the opposite. It is God in his mercy saying, I've been a good God, a covenant-keeping God, a merciful God, you for hundreds of years realize your decision, it's going to jeopardize that, and you will not get what you think you want. So God tells Samuel, before they make this decision ironclad, protest solemnly with them. The idea here is counseling or warning someone about their behavior and that you're a witness here to it to them. It's also a legal connotation is how it was used. And in that sense, here's what it would show. It's indicating God is saying to them, you can do this, but I will be absolved of any wrongdoing in granting your request. In refusing to listen, the people are incriminating themselves against their loving, holy, merciful God. And so he, going beyond recusing himself, warns them about what kind of earthly sovereign will claim amongst them as a people. He says, show them the manner of the king they'll have. The idea here is that it speaks to the custom of a king in regards to a subject. You need to tell them what to expect from an earthly ruler. It speaks of what he will claim by his right and what he will say is just for him to have as an earthly ruler. And for verses 10 through 17, God outlines for them and for Samuel to tell them what a king is going to do that he has not done as their ruler now. In verses 10 through 17, Samuel receives the warnings from God, transmits them to the leaders, and it's clear that the goal of a king will be what? His kingdom. The goal of your earthly king will not be to help you in and of itself. He will be concerned with his kingdom and his legacy, and guess who gets to build his legacy? Guess who gets to pay for his legacy? Guess who gets to fund his legacy? Guess who provides the labor for his legacy? You get the idea here? God says, I want you to know what you're asking. Now consider this with me. Note how many times God uses the word take and contrasts with the word your to show the people that what you think you're going to get, it's not going to happen. What you have will become his. And so he begins pointing this out. I like the way one author put it. He put it like this. As God pointed out to Samuel to point out to the nation of Israel, the decision to have a permanent king meant much more than the addition of one person to the circle of power in Israel. It entailed the establishment of a permanent, multi-tiered, bureaucratic institution utilizing the service of thousands of individual or constituents. To underwrite this form of government, Vast quantities of personal and family resources would have to be given over to the king. And so what does this look like? Well, in verses 11 and 12, consider this. The king is going to take their young men for his military purposes. In verses 11 through 12, think what he talks about here. This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He'll take your sons, appoint them for himself, his chariots, his horsemen, to run before his chariots. What's God telling them? He's saying, this king will have a royal guard, and it's going to be your kids. It's going to be your sons. This king will have a cavalry, and it's going to be your kids, your sons. This king will have a strategic strike force made up of your sons. This king will have officers in high-ranking positions, and they will be your sons. This, This king will take your sons to become his weapon makers and have maintenance over strategic food supplies. He's going to take our young people? Oh, it's worse than that. Verse 13, he says, and by the way, your daughters will be employed in servitude to help the king ensure a high quality of life for the royal family. And so in verse 12 and 13, or 11, 12, and 13, we already see what? This king is going to be concerned and consumed with 
the expansion of his kingdom and legacy, and it will be at the expense of you as a nation. In verse 14, their fields will be requisitioned by the king to sustain his programs. Look at verse 14. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them. Now consider this. This is more than just a seizure of land by the king. Remember, they're an agrarian culture. This seizure means a lack of income-producing props now. This seizure means a lack of ability to have the yearly income you could have. In fact, it's not a tax. It's just a reduction by seizing your assets. Verse 15 is where the taxes come in. Look at verse 15. He says, and he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. What's God saying? Hey, hierarchy doesn't come cheap, right? Bureaucracy comes with a price tag, and that price tag will be the tenth of what you have. His governmental infrastructure will need to be funded. Verse 16, he'll seize those whom you employ and could help you create income necessary for your household and use them for his gain and his advantage. Verse 16, he says, and he'll take your men servants and your maid servants and goodliest young men and what? Put them to his work. And verse 17, he'll seize your assets but demand you maintain his product. Almost a feudal or even a slavery consideration here in verse 17. He says, he'll take the tenth of your sheep, and ye shall be his servants. So God has told Samuel to tell the nation of Israel, what you think you want is not really what you're going to get. Okay, you don't want me to rule? You want an earthly king you can see and be proud of and vault your status up among the other nations? You don't want to be this theocracy that looks sniveling among all the other nations who have a powerful, mighty leader that they can see? He says, okay, you can do that. You can get that. But it will not be what you want or what you think. So, what will their response be? We'll check verse 18. You're going to cry out in that day when all this happens to you because your king, which you have chosen, and the Lord's not going to hear you. Think about this. God warns them in his mercy and kindness that by the time you figure it out, by the time you recognize that what I said would come to pass has come to pass, by the time that happens, you will be so desperately frustrated, and you'll want a change so needfully, it'll be too late. Your king will be unfulfilling. Your king, your leader will be harsh. Your king, it will grieve you, but it will be too late. Consider God's words that we never want to have spoken over us. In that day, when you finally realize what you've given up and what you've embraced, in that moment, in those regrets, in that moment of sorrow, in that time of emptiness, God says, I'm not going to hear you. Let's consider this. It's not that God will not be omniscient in that day. He'll still be all-knowing in that day, won't he? It's not that God will be unloving or unkind in that day. He'll still be loving. He'll still be kind. He doesn't change. It's not that God will be unable to deliver them in that day. He will still be omnipotent, all-powerful, and able. It is this. God allowing the choices of idolatry to produce the fruit he warned them of. He's still merciful, yes. He's still kind, but he gives great freedom for either our benefit or our detriment based upon decisions of faith or upon decisions of doubt. And God says in that day, as you've made decision after decision of doubt, you will reap the fruit of that doubt, and I will not step in to deliver you from what you so desperately wanted and needed and now so desperately want to get rid of. That's a pretty awful message to receive, isn't it? Mercifully, we're just ending a political season locally and nationally, right? <laughs> or we hope, anyway. <laughs> Can you imagine, though, if we had backed up about a month and this was somebody's campaign slogan or running platform? 
Vote for Paul Norton. I prove this ad and I'm going to take. Vote for Paul Norton. In five years, you'll regret me. Vote for Paul Norton. Your God will give you what you deserve. <laughs> you know, what a lousy platform. What a horrible voting apparatus to consider. And maybe in some areas of our country that kind of took place. I don't know, right? But I want you to consider this. God, in his mercy and kindness, in his long suffering, didn't just let them walk right in without them having to walk over who he is and what he has said. God warned them about what would take place. So lastly tonight, hearing the warning, Israel places their trust in a human leader rather than their covenant-keeping God. <sighs> right? Right? Look at verse 19. Though God's told Samuel to listen to the people, they've refused to listen to God or Samuel. Look at verse 19. What happens here? Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and said, Nay, but we will have a king over us. Consider the wall that they're having to pull vault over to get what they want. God just said to them, through their faithful, righteous prophet and judge, you can get a king, but recognize what's going to happen. And they go through that checklist and still say, yeah, yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. It's a, what are we talking about, right? It's insane in a situation. The man God sent to rescue the position of judge from the corrupt Eli and his sons, the man who's guided them for decades faithfully, they ignore. The God who's willing to communicate with them and warn them, he's ignored. And what's their response to that? We will have a king. And verse 20 really reveals all the motivation behind it, doesn't it? In verse number 20, what does he say, or the people say? that we also may be like all the nations, and note this, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. What's really going on here? What's motivating them? Well, they want a king to judge them rather than worry about who will be their next judge. Again, both Eli and Samuel's offspring have given maybe legitimacy to their concerns about the office of a judge and a prophet, but their idea that a flawed man will be greater than their covenant-keeping God who can work through flawed judges is just the height of disbelief. Beyond that, they want a king to lead in their battles rather than have to rely upon the Lord and utilize the ark as a symbol of his presence. They're confusing the defeats they suffered by their own foolishness with the times God did lead and was mighty, as we saw last time in chapter number 7. They're saying, in effect, we want somebody we can look at, somebody we can be proud of, somebody that inspires fear in the hearts of our enemies, somebody who produces that. That's what we want. We don't want you, God. We don't want to have to rely upon you. We don't want to have to come to you. We want our king to say, we got this. You know what they want? They want the number one pick in the draft, right? And we'll see in the future. That's what they get. What is Saul? That, spoiler alert, that's who they choose as their king. <laughs> What's Saul? He's tall. He's good looking. He seems to have all the right features needed to be a really good king. And yet, spiritually, he is bankrupt. But they get what they want. Because here they say to their God, we don't want you. We want somebody we can see. Somebody we can be proud of. Somebody who can lead us in our battles. Somebody who can vault our status up so we don't look so puny amongst the other nations. Oh, we want it all for this life, this world. Catch verse 20 and 20, or 21 and 22. A likely discouraged Samuel returns to God and discloses, I'm putting that in quote, discloses Israel's decision. Now, catch this, young people. This is not recorded because God doesn't know what Israel's decision is. It's recorded, rather, to remind future readers like us that the God of Israel was willing to interact at a personal level even with Samuel. And beyond that, if he would interact at a personal level, how much more was he sufficient at a national level? If the God of the universe will take time for one individual and discourse with them, is he not sufficient to take care of yay more than that? And of course the answer would be yes. So this sad trajectory changing moment in Israel's history ends with Samuel doing what? Go home, people. 
And I'm going to start the search for your king, which is what we see in chapter 9 and chapter number 10. So once you catch it, they will get what they want, but it will not be what they desire. Give us a king. That's what we need. It's what we crave. It's what we have to have to be legitimate and go forward. But it won't be, and God even told you it won't be. But they did it anyway in doubt and in disbelief. So what do we learn? I mean, it seems a bit ridiculous, right? They've heard and read of the might of their covenant-keeping God from the past. They have experienced firsthand his ability and, his, and the folly of circumventing his rule. Uh, they've received spiritual care from an imperfect but faithful judge in Samuel. They've been warned by God about the radical deviation this will be in their relationship with him and in their national history. Yet what do they do? They still insist on getting what they think they want. This kind of leaves us shaking our heads, or at least it should, right? God told you. And you said yes anyway? And we kind of just shake our heads. But maybe let's get personal. Before we throw too many rocks mentally at the Israelites, Maybe we should consider times in our own lives and temptations that have caused us to think there's a better king out there than King Jesus for us as his followers. Consider that while we are not Israel under a theocracy, we understand that contextually and historically, we do know this. We are adopted children of God. We are heirs because of Christ Jesus. We are citizens in Jesus' eternal kingdom. And we're on a mission, are we not? As his ambassadors to proclaim the gospel to those around us. You consider, we have the full revelation of God declared to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And we have a copy of the word in our language. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and our union with Christ gives us victory over sin, as we're talking about this week in small group out of 1 Peter chapter number 4. We have in the church spiritual leadership to teach, warn, and correct us and help us. We have one another in the church to help in our spiritual journey. And yet, if we're not exposed to truth in the Word regularly, and we're not spiritually accountable in our relationships to the church, and certainly beyond that in the larger family of God, we can quickly find ourselves sure that we need someone or something else to fulfill our desires. Maybe we can say it like this. Anyone or anything can shift from its intended place and purpose by God for His glory to become out of place and have a hold upon us that God never intended or desired. They can become kings that we search after and seek after. How, what does that look like, Pastor? Well, we could use a variety of items, right? Maybe we'll just take two simple ones just to try to illustrate it. You think about relationships, right? Relationships can easily become a, a king in our life. Your spouse seeking your spouse to be your king. You want your kids to be your king, give you that which you think you really want, need, or desire. You, you think if I move from single to having a relationship, oh, then everything will be, and that's just an illusory king. Or maybe it's materialism, that next job, that new house, that next car, that next position, that next promotion, that next experience, that next item, whatever it is, that king captivates us, and we think this is what I truly want and need rather than submit myself as a follower of Jesus to what he has said is best and right in my life. You see, the awful thing about you and I, the Israelites in their time, wanting a king is that it flips the role of God as the creator worthy of worship to the creation making demands steeped in sin and ignorant in their outcome. Friend, can I put it like this? 
kings in our life, they make promises of a better life by our frail, sin-infected viewpoint. Kings in our life say God's authority in our life is lacking or he's holding out on us or he's not enough. A, a king in our life says the thou shalt nots are really just outdated or God is just being an ogre. When it's not the case at all, God in his holiness knows what's best for us, doesn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Kings in our life require us to ignore God's merciful warnings he puts across our path like hurdles in front of a runner, a hurdler, whatever they are, <laughs> like hurdles in front of them. He's trying to stop us. Speed bumps may be a little bit better for me. I know that. Speed bumps. He's trying to stop us, slow us down. Kings require us to reject or manipulate God's word for us to be able to proceed. Friend, when you have God's word, when I have a spiritual confidant warning me, talking to me, intervening with me, forecasting with you about your decision, and we still are just like, nope, full speed ahead, full speed ahead, full speed ahead. May God help us to realize that flare, that red flag should be screaming at us, stop, repent, and yield to our rightful king, King Jesus. While Israel is sure that becoming like the other nations was the answer to their issues and would vault their status as a nation, I want to stress this. This is a tragic moment in their history, and it has lasting repercussions. It's a stark reminder that rejecting God's revealed will does not fulfill what we perceive to be lacking in our lives. So I say it again. Rejecting God's rule and his warnings can get you what you think you want, but it will not ultimately be what you desire. Now that said, amid the sadness or the tragedy of this passage, can I remind us of something? The starkness and sobriety of the passage should be taken in. The starkness and sobriety should be considered. The starkness and sobriety should be acted upon, but let's understand something. Even in spite of chapter 8 here, or despite chapter 8, God still worked through their rejection, and he still worked in their midst, though they did suffer the consequences for their decision. And I would remind us, King Jesus does the same for you and I. If you have in your mind or in your life or in your memory or with somebody close to you a give us a king moment that's coming to your mind right now, and you live a life that you have some regrets regularly because of that, could I remind us that your king's ruler, your king as a ruler, his forgiveness is greater than the moment you demanded a different king? I want you to consider that with me. It's not that you won't have still maybe some consequences that there haven't been or still are that you're dealing with, but can I say if you had such a moment, such a give me a king moment with God, your value has not diminished with him, and he can still work in, through, and despite any choices we have made. I would say let your give us a king moment draw you closer to your king and grant you the ability to minister to others. This chapter is a sad chapter, but it wasn't the end of what God was willing and able to do. And tonight, my friends, if there's been a moment or a few that we've had some pretty trajectory-changing decisions in our life. We know that they're there. We know how we had them and how we got there. But today, your king's still merciful and able and willing to work in and through your life. He wants to use you for his glory. And he wants to help others through your life and through your testimony. So I want to challenge us tonight. Let's learn from chapter 8, as Paul said, it's an example to us, and may we let him identify any area of my heart in which I have this idea of a king I want, but it's actually a false king. It's an idol. It will not bring the satisfaction and fulfillment that only I can enjoy in and through my relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment tonight to reflect on what we've heard about when God gives us what we really want and how rejecting him rejecting his rule, rejecting his warnings. It gets us what we think, but it doesn't really get us what we desire. 
And tonight, if God stirred something in our heart, in our life, or in a relationship with somebody else, let's act upon it in faith. God, I pray you'd help me. I can think of several of these times in my life. I can think of moments in the lives of those that you have put in my sphere of influence over the last 20 plus years of being your child, where we've seen myself or another have a give us our king moment. There's great regret, there's frustration, there's pain there, and yet it's not the end. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that it wasn't the end for Israel, though it was certainly detrimental. I'm thankful you still worked through them, and we're standing here today, we're uh, congregated today because you still worked through them to deliver the Messiah. So may we be challenged, but may we also be encouraged. May we have sobriety, but may we also have joy because of our good God who is worthy to be yielded to, surrendered to, followed after. So God, we ask for you to help us tonight. We can't do it of our own. I know I can't. And I know my brothers and sisters in the room can as well. So reveal change and help in any way we need by the power of your spirit and with the truth of your word. We ask it for Jesus' glory in our lives. Amen. Let's take a moment as Pastor Jordan and the instrumentalists play. With our heads bowed, I want to give you a moment of privacy to reflect on what you've heard. And if God has stirred something in your heart and you want to take some time to pray, pray there. If you'd like me to pray with you, I'll put my mask on. I'll be down front. I'll be glad to pray with you. If you're watching online, you see there the contact information on the screen. You say, boy, there's something I need to talk about. Would you reach out? Call us. Text us. Email us. We're available. We're around. We want to be a help. I'm going to turn off my mic. I'm going to be down front. If you'd like to pray, I'll be glad to pray with you. Church family, let's go ahead and stand. I pray that um, not only in just the time of reflection just now, uh, you consider maybe some kings in your life that the Holy Spirit has shown you that uh, you need to repent of, but even throughout this week, um, that the Lord would bring back his word and just the desire for the, um, the Israelites to have this king and that uh, we have that same temptation and that we would be convicted of it and come back to the Lord. Let's find some encouragement and truth from this last couple songs. He will hold me fast. I fear my faith fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would fail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold, he must hold me. He will hold me fast, He will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast. Rosie says, 
Those he saves are his. I, Christ, will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight, he will hold me fast. He'll not, he'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. For my life. For my life he bled, died. Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life. He will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sight. When he comes at last, he will hold me fast, he will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast, he will hold me fast, he will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came through in sin. singing this evening. You are dismissed. We will see you next Sunday.